and you put the port dual marker bottle and a hidden marker bottle and then with a one with a one probability for any of the symbols in the state. And of course effectively you will have Right. Um, so uh, you know this is more all about why hidden, eh? so between observed parts and from the hidden parts, and this is the cloudless decoupling you know, I already referred to this, so you can skip it. Now, this is in, in, indeed nice to, to, to know, and we've seen this already. Here is a model for well, that in the moment. So, at least if you have an HMM and you'll feed it a sequence, an input sequence, it will evaluate that sequence and it will come up, well, depending on how you do it, with a probability, with a score, in terms of the probability of that given input sequence. And if you would like to recognize something, some feature you have modeled in your, in your hidden money or HMM, you hope, of course, that an input sequence that fulfills that characterization and the high score, the sequence that wouldn't have it, would score lower. That's the idea of a good HMM. Okay, this is still true. For, each given, for a given input sequence, each sequence symbol, each letter in the sequence will map to a stage in the HMM. You will run the sequence through the model, which you don't know from the outside which stage that is. Yeah? And here you get again, you have the emission probabilities. And if you faithfully multiply the correct emission probabilities and the correct transition probabilities, then you're fine, right? There's nothing really implicitly difficult about it. It's a lot of bookkeeping. And in your coding, you will need to be aware that the English should be correct. Otherwise, you go horrendously wrong with a lot. Okay, uh, yeah, this is one thing. Since you have a, uh, uh, a hidden Markov uh, model, you know, this is maybe not the best example, but basically, Sequence could run in very many ways to a model. It means you have very many pathways that would you know, emit your sequence. So if you want to talk about total, the idea of total probability, then you need to evaluate each of those possible pathways, potentially very, very many, and add up all those probabilities. So it's a lot of computation, I think. So what will you have to do? Will the computer do your assignment run for two months, you think? So we get an idea to, to make this faster than this. There are algorithms that I will cover today. So this is the total probability having to do with all possible pathways, summing all the probabilities. And then there is another thing that you've seen already, and that is more about would there be any of those pathways that I would like more than the other for some reason? And the reason would be the score or the total probability. And then you try and find that pathway. You've seen that in sequence analysis in kind of programming. That's basically what we so that's uh, another question you might ask to your model, what would be the optimal path? And if you want to find an optimal path, that is then a path that is of course defined, right? In a marked model or not, you need to know that path. So you need to reconstruct it. And then of course, as, as I said before, you know, before you can all start doing this, asking these questions, you need your hidden mark parameterized. So all emission parameters as is here, but also all uh, transition probabilities should be known in order to allow you to calculate some probability of the given sequence. Right? Okay, back to these three problems. I'll work them out completely with all the algorithms, so you can start your assignment. But I go into a few uh, things you could do to use the model. Already you know the model is a lot larger. So basically, I already showed you the last time with, with Markov models, DNA can you know contains genes and genes may code encode proteins and when they do then you have this triplet structure, the colon structure, the DNA coding happens in groups of three, and then it's just as well when you model that, that such a model takes that into account. And you see that here, this is here for a code on the triplet, the codons are, and the hidden Markov model works. And these are states that are letters in, but typically of course if it's hidden Markov, they should have all these emission probabilities. This is just a simplification, these pictures, but you see this is the codon ID. And you would have star codon. Probably the emission probabilities for the, for the letter A here will be pretty high, and for T and so on and so on, and here for any of the three stop codes. Now, uh, and then you see in practice that you know, we know stuff happens around star codons, so there are other likelihoods that you might want to capture, and there are many different roles. So basically, if you know how to deal with the market models, you could model almost anything. Certainly, stock market principle. So if you think about making some, some rush, maybe, perhaps people have to use market technology to 
try to do that. No guarantees for this. Um, okay, so this is a uh, hidden market model for unspliced genes here. Yeah? So for, for material genes, for example. Will there be. Um, yeah, so uh, a bit of knowledge. So it, it, luckily that is the case. Why can we do gene prediction? So luckily, there's a happy thing there that gene sequences, parts of DNA that encode genes, behave a bit differently than parts that do not. If there would not be a difference, we would have a very hard time of recognizing them. But since they are a bit different, we can, we can use that fact. And uh, so here they talk about typical and atypical. I will define as that, but you know, there are certain few differences. And if you can group your data into two these categories, you might say, oh, then I may get a market model that incorporates those two, and I can juxtapose and then compare these two, these two data differences. Okay, so here is one then. That's the model I showed you smaller two or three slides ago. So you have a star code on. Do you see ATG coming up? Is it an all or nothing thing? No, it is biology. So even now and then, although the textbook says ETG, you know, in practice it's not always happening, and you see non zero probabilities for all of this. But yes, that bias, of course, towards the known ETG. Here should somehow be the stop cones, but this seems that they zoom in well. Is this the three or maybe two? I think this is the six stop cone they go here. You know, in the table of three, so you might have um, Okay, so what is this? Here you see then that, you know, you can get an inkling already of, you know, the differences that might occur in a typical coding sequence and an atypical coding sequence, detail of the last slide. And here you see how it would work out. So how could this model be, be evaluated by sequence? It starts, of course, here, then it could go in this path, and if you have a million sequence of a million, it would have to cycle around a bit slower, otherwise you won't see the dot. Uh, many times here, and then get out here, or take the atypical route here, and cycle, turning in a lot of times. This is, by the way, you can't see it from here, but this is used, this type of models are used as a second order model, because we know that the third position, what can happen here, is influenced by the two earlier positions in the codon, so you know that in a market model, in a technology, using a second order, so not only memorizing the last state, but the before last state. Yeah. This is also why it is inhomogeneous, by the way, because we treat different letters in sequence, different, for example, in at least color regions. Okay, now, uh, this is just to show you there are models that are based on hidden market technology, so I will not linger on this very much. So you can, uh, you can download them and look up on the internet. It was all happening. And there is even you know, professional software. There you go. Software was a company. Pretty busy all of this. And, uh, yeah. So in a mark of models and then using some, some discriminant analysis to take the numbers that come out of the model and the size it once again. So all kinds of things happen around in the market. Here is one for uh, an example. for. Eukaryotic gene finding, what's the hallmark of eukaryotes? They have entrants and exits, I'll put that again. Entrants are things that should be skipped by, you know, in the, in the, in the final messenger RNA. And there were some regions in DNA that indicated the cut sites, say, you know, where the system should say, okay, I cut out the intron here, and that's called the splice donor and the splice acceptor site. And there are all kinds of rules about it, so the letter GT for donor model is is really very important, but there are other rules here, so you could put all of that in the model, train, you know, train the model using sequences that have exits and entrance, and see, you know, and hope for the best, of course. So you see here that it's also important to discern the three possible frames in one direction of the DNA, and you see that it's done here, where you see here, you know, frame shift one, frame shift two, frame shift three. So you need to run it across here to be able to evaluate all DNA sequences basically in any frame having any uh, intro excellence. Okay. If you want to read more about it, Anders Kropp is one of the uh, pioneering figures. He started in '94 with this stuff. Multiple alignment routine and used in a market. And he's been at it ever since and successful. So it can make it I'm not saying you should, but it's, it's okay. Okay. 
Um, so what parameters do we have? Okay, so the transition parameter is defined to, uh, in, 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 in uh, so given that you were in the state i minus 1, what is the probability of getting over to a state i uh, from one state to another? And in your model you would see, in the visualization of your model, you would see an arrow with a non-zero probability. And the letter pi all is now taken as the letter to represent the path. That's why I see that here. This is the state i, and this is the state i minus 1. Okay, what we're talking about here in the market of HMMs. Um, we have these emission parameters. And that is, you know, an emission parameter is there for each letter, each possible letter in the sequence in each of the states. So this is this, this probability, this, this, uh, the emission probability of the letter B of the sequence when that letter would appear in state K. Here you see that, here are these K's, just a numbering system to, to, uh, to be able to uh, tell the states apart. In the state R, you'll get state zero, the last number is for the end state, and again, you know, we've, we've talked about this. This might be a mission probability for the letter A, the state of two, and here we go, this transition probability. Uh, no need for this. So, for example, you might have a test database, test, uh, test sequences, maybe these two, CGT and CTC, I don't know if you learn a lot from them, for example, and then you might have a market model, and maybe this is reminiscent, reminiscent to what you're doing, it might be close to the sort of model you're going to make, it won't be very big, right? It's about principle, you're not calculating yourself in a million states, which is two or three or four, then doable, and even you, the, the, the brain can do it. That's good. Um, so typically, uh, if you have a model like this, with three states, a begin state and an end state, and a set of initial probabilities, and here you see if this is the ordering, that there's a probability of one to start in the begin state, and zero anywhere else, and then you have these uh, transition uh, matrix, a full matrix for the transition probabilities in two directions, and another matrix you know, covering all the possible letters in the sequence, and all possible non-silent states, and you have all emission probability defined by them. So two matrices basically will define, will define your data model. Okay? Three problems, here are the questions. The most probable path and the thing you know from dynamic programming is easy. There are many possible pathways, what is the best one? We're going to worry about this also here in the, for the market models. Then there is this other notion, and that's called the evaluation problem. Problem: How likely is, it, is, is an input sequence? So you would need to evaluate all possible pathways, and very many typically, that that sequence could run through the model, add up all probabilities. It's quite a task to think that it would give you the total probability, and therefore the likelihood of that sequence, given the model. And as we said, the learning problem is maybe the hardest. You see that? How do we, how do we get to it? setting all these parameters. Um, basically, hidden market models were, in fact, and this um, paper in the end that I uh, cite came from uh, phonology, from, from spoken sentences, from sounds. We tried to segment these sentences that people speak. So that uh, that's, was the first use of hidden market models. And ever since it has been, uh, the use has been quite wide. There's hardly any area anywhere for hidden market models to do not have. Okay, so let's make it a bit more uh, um, well, uh, symbolic, say, mathematical. Here is your problem. What is A and E? This stands for all transition probabilities and all emission probabilities. So given a market model and the sequence, what is the exact pathway that this input sequence would take? There's no algorithm for this. We've already started looking at that, I think. Does the word trails already mean something? Terry, what is that? Is that a thing? It's crazy. Almost anything in science. Okay, and then, uh, you know, and then the other question will be given A to Z and, and, uh, and the sequence, what would be uh, the total probability or the probability, the likelihood of that sequence. And then, given a set of sequences, typically training sequences, how would we set the parameters? All the, uh, of the model, so all the position parameters, probabilities, and emission probabilities. 
This we do is a strange sort of thing, and that's called forward, backward, and uh, the two gentlemen, I think they were Bob and Lance, who did this, carry still the, yeah, the bucket in the second tower, I guess. Okay, so let's start doing it. There are three important questions, so let's do the first one. The one you know best, the one you've done already, and you'll do basically the exact same algorithm. There's one, one, one thing different, that's basically all. This is called the Viterbi algorithm. So we first are going to find the best scoring or the most likely path. Out of the very many possible pathways, you want to select the optimal path. Could there be, as we had in dynamic programming, could it be multiple pathways that would evaluate the same highest score? Absolutely. It can happen in DP, and it can certainly happen here. But, you know, typically, as we did for sequence analysis, you choose this one of those pathways. Can you do some high route or low route? Mm, that's good. But anyway, I think about it. Okay, so I showed you this slide last time. So given an input sequence AAC here, it could run like this in two different ways, or it could run under in two different ways, I think, till the end. If you have three letters, and each of those pathways taken, so this one would be first letter goes, so you start, the first letter of the C, the first A goes in here, then you go back into this state to emit the second letter A in the sequence, and then you would have to go here to emit the letter C in this state, B, and then you go to the end. The total probability is all, is multiplied, the uh, transition probabilities and all emission probabilities all, you know, during your path, on the way. And if you go like under here, then you would get another score, you can see it, this pathway where 0, 2, 2, 4, 5 is taken, so 0 in here, back in here, then on to the end. Scores twice as high as any other pathway. So this would be the highest score. This pathway should need to be selected and found by the Viterbi algorithm. Okay, so a bit of symbolic, but here you see it all coming up, what we just did, uh, you know, just by seeing the numbers. What have we got here? Um, so this is, you have a given sequence and a given state path, and how does this path score? Well, again, all transition parameters, the A parameters, and all emission parameters all the way, if you carry out, if you run through this path. Yeah? And here you see, how do you end? Going to path I presented in Okay. And if you want to shorten this, then you have just sequence and pathway. No indices here, just short. And this is a Durbin. See that one. Okay. So, again, the Terry algorithm. There was a gentleman who thought the first time about this, how to carry it out, and he did the, you know, the bookkeeping, the algorithm that this could do the bookkeeping to evaluate all possibilities. And uh, so you need to find the probability. So each cell is now defined as the probability of the single most likely path that will end up there. Do you remember how you would define a cell in your search matrix for dynamic programming where you were doing sequence analysis? Do you remember you took the max out of three possibilities coming from the top, from the diagonal, or from the left? Do you remember that? What was the definition of the value of each cell? That subsequences, sequence ending in IJ, a cell is just the score, the score of the highest possible pathway, any possible pathway that would lead into that cell. Right? We do the exact same thing. It's the same thing. Okay? And as we did, we define that recursively for dynamic programming, we do the exact same, same thing here. So here you go, this you remember, I hope. Have another look. Uh, this is what we're going to do now. Why is this example not great? Because this is just three, and I would like to tell you uh, in hidden markets it could be 10, it could come down from 10 quarters, or 20, or 3 million, if you have a big model, or one, you know. And, and I have three here, that's not good, but I was too lazy to just start with it. So just think in your mind there's one other such thing here. Oh, this is the error here, see? So more of that. Really four or five or, or many, okay? So basically, here again, what's the definition of this? So any any pathway starting maybe in the begin state somewhere here, that, that, that 
C to the run through. If I have done that part of the sequence ending here, I don't care what path I was taken. I just want the value of the It's just accepting C. And uh, so here is that, you know, reassuring, you know, this is nothing new, it looks new, but it's based already, which is master in the first assignment, right? So, uh, so how do we score it? Let's go to this picture. So what is this pathway? You start in the begin state, and then you have some transition probability in the state, and an emission probability, and again, transition probability to the next state, and again, an emission probability of the letter that is then emitted. So you do all of this, you end up here. So what is the value in the cell? All states, all emission probabilities, and uh, emission pro and transition probabilities on the way, the best scoring path on the way to the cell. That value of the scoring path, including the emission probability of that cell itself. Okay. If you want to do this, durability. So here you go, and this is what you see here. So that means the value of any of the Viterbi cells is defined as you know, the max over all all possibilities, and this is the recursion again, which is by just programming, they can think of that three possibilities. Here it might be 20 possibilities, don't know. So you cycle over all possible states that could lead into the cell, and then you take the max value times the emission parameter of what? Of that state, see, this is in this state, L, and what symbol are we at when we're in the cell? And why did it take the values? Well, on the max over all preceding states, if you like. And if you're in, in secret symbol uh, I here, where have you got to be necessarily when you're in an earlier state? One letter earlier being bookie. Brief bookie. Okay. So here, um, uh, you know, we have, we have this recursion again, so here's the same formula. There's one extra thing, don't worry about it, it won't happen in your model, but just for, um, uh, for, for, for the frequency sake. So here you have, uh, by the way, what did we do if we real, remember the story of those points? Then you remember, what was that the dynamic program? The race back, right? We do that here too. Because in the end, we need that pathway out, that best pathway, out of very many. So we're going to remember the little bricks at each of the corners. And how do you do this? If you come from a cell, you choose the best one, you remember it. If you don't do this, in my guess, you have to calculate for each of them again, it's far more expensive. So you invest a bit of memory to be able to carry out faster calculations. Now, here is this one. This is not in the, in the dirty book. But look, look at the differences. This is the the, 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 what, is, what is the difference here for certain states? Do you see the difference? We don't have the emission parameter here. Is that a surprise to you? Shouldn't be because it's a side of state. Ah, brilliant. But now, do you see another difference? I see one other difference. And you? I see I minus one here, and I see I there. What is it? Remember, it's a silent state. What happens with your sequence? You're in, you have a symbol, you're in a state. Now you go over to a silent state. What happens with your sequence? Will it shift to the next? No, because it, nothing will be emitted. If you go out of this silent state, maybe in the next state, which is non silent, then the sequence says, ah, ah, I'm so happy I can emit another letter. That's very nice thinking. Right? So in a silent state, no letter is emitted, that means that the index of the sequencer MI will change. So that's why you don't have this I minus one business in it. It's the letter I in the But again, this is all very difficult. Or something you don't like sign the stage of brain is want to believe it. That's fine. It will not harm you in the sign. It's like it all in the middle of the sequence. Only you have to deal with the beginning and the end stage, but that's a question of case. So you will not uh, have a spottering sequence, so to speak, right? Staying at the same point for a while. Okay, so, and then in the end, what have you got? This is just to say, look, you know, if you are at the very end of your algorithm for global dynamic program, do you remember where you would always end up? Global dynamic program, where in the matrix did you end up? You should remember for you, uh, think of the right? Right in the corner. So, there is a cell like that as well, where you have to end, typically the end state, of course. 
in the Bible, and then you talk about termination, it's total progress. And what will that be? That is just, you know, all the states that carry the last letter in the sequence, the H, and the And you would again, you throw the little stone like you can to remember where you came from. And then if you have all these little things, you can do your trace back. What is that? Just following the pointers back from where you were. That's what you don't do in your algorithm, right? If you don't, build the Okay, so we need a bit of um, bookkeeping because just a simple trick, you know, being in this cell, you come from the top. From this or that is now more a bit extended because basically you could come from any state or the state in the model. So the algorithms take that into account. So that means just doing three is not enough. You should really make something at each state. You should be able to come from all the states. And Viterbi, uh, Andrew Viterbi started thinking about this and um, came up with this trellis. And what's the dimensionality of the trellis? It is uh, the sequence length, time here. Uh, n is the number of states. So here you go. You just can it. And for any state, you need to take into account that you could come from any other state. That's what giving you. And the sequence length is a bit unfortunate. I would prefer the letter L for the length of the sequence. But anyway, n is the number. Small n. Okay, so here's how this would look. Here are all the states. And here are all the states. Once again, right? And that means, and this why do you do this? Well, if you're interested in the value in this state, where could it all come from? Well, you look at the arrows, and basically it could come from any other state because they're all nicely listed here. This, of course, the other mark more restrictions. And if you have a million states, this trellis will have, you know, calls of a million states. Pretty big and hard to compute for Okay? So it's important to realize that I checked it because sometimes it's funny things. What order model is this? So if I can come from how many states? Well, this is a simple word, but I mean, please observe that any stage will only be able to come from the last column, so to speak, right? This is the bookie. Yeah. Otherwise, you make a big mess. Both allow cells, oh, you know, I have flexibility. Let's hop from here and immediately there. Very nice, you know, black in chess. Don't do this stuff, right? Be faithful to the theory. The bookie becomes down the hay line. And that's not a good idea if you are a bookie. Okay, so... Um, <coughs> And then this, you know, you will build this type of thing. So how would this work? Here you have this thing, it's called the trellis. And if you have a model like this with two states, and, or, or if you gain two states and an end state, you could do this, and then this is your trellis. Yeah? And of course, you know, you, you, you add an extra symbol to start to end. And this is the trellis, and in your model, you did it with paper, I think, already. If you, you know, hopefully after this lecture, if you couldn't do it on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, yesterday, try that again because it's important to understand this. Okay, so this is so. What are we going to do? It's just dynamic programming. Here's the algorithm once again, right? And then you, you look for each of the cells, or you, you calculate where you came from in the trellis, this last, this last column of all the cells in the trellis. And you multiply it with the emission probability of the state you are at. That's important. Yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah, we did this, we did this, and now we are here. And again, we have that problem, of course, that if you know computers don't like to don't all that like to multiply small numbers, but very soon they won't be able to tell whether it's zero or not. And you know, we the, the solving that is using the log, local version, back again, for then in the program we used to do this. We don't go over the back trans translation, but here we won't model. In your models, we will not go to the log and edit it small enough. So you just stick at really at the faithful statistics with the probabilities. The real probabilities you will multiply. Okay. We don't do this problem. Okay, so this was uh, all I need to tell you about the therapy. And now we do it another time. I know exactly the same thing now. 
we change one little thing. To be very the important thing is up here, you recognize this thing, right? This is the dynamic program. You select the max out of all the possibilities. And remember that one. To be able to go back. Now we do another one. And this is the other problem, is that sketch, no, what was the probability then? What is the total, what is the, the likelihood, the probability of an input sequence? Taking into, the, into account that that sequence could go through very many different pathways to the model, you have to take all these probabilities, add them up, and that is your final score for the sequence. So how do we do that? That sounds like expensive, right? All these pathways are resilient. So how can we break that problem up in small pieces? And this again is that this uh, boring almost, right? Probability you have to faithfully multiply all proper um, transition probabilities and initial probabilities. Okay? This is what we saw in this hard work once again. I'll skip it. So here is that problem, you know. We have need a total probability. So given an input sequence and a model, we would like to have the probabilities over all possible pies, over all possible pathways. But they can, of course, be very, very many. So we have a problem, but luckily there is a forward algorithm that comes to the rescue to solve this combinatorial problem for you. And you're going to implement that algorithm as well in your uh, class assignment. Now, instead of a VK, because this algorithm is called forward, anymore, we use the letter F, or to define the V to F, and basically what are we going to do? We need now to, to take into account all possible pathways and add up the scores. There are two ways of doing that, just thinking, you know, intuitively. If you would know all possible pathways, you would carry out each of the pathways, record the score at the end, move the second pathway through the model, Record the score, do for all of those, and then add up all those numbers. That will give you the total probability. Here we do it a bit different, like in dynamic growth. You say, ah, but many of these pathways will overlap somewhere, right? So basically, you look per cell, so thinking here, you say, well, what could I come in? And what do I do now? Do I take the maximum? Or is there something magical, mathematical you could use? You add them up. That's basically the only, the only difference. So we just use the same algorithm. I don't have to encode a lot. And here you go. Uh, uh, so basically we talk about uh, that if you are in a letter in a cell, what's the, prob what's the probability of this state? All possibilities to get uh, into, into this state. So from what states can you get into state 4 here? That's indicated by the orange arrows. From this state it was before or from the state itself? Okay, so. Do you know if there's any difference with the Viterbi algorithm? What's the only difference? The box is now a sigma sign indicating we need to add up the values, not selecting the max, but add them up. And, uh, and uh, so for cyber stage, you have the same thing that we discussed before, and the sequence doesn't move to the next. And you don't have an emission parameter, it's all the same. And why is there no trace back here, by the way? Trace back, what is it playing here? Mm -hmm. Yes, no? No, no, I like this. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Because this is not about the same path, right? It's about all possible paths. So, hey, let me trace back. So it's all fine. You don't need it. So it's even simpler algorithm. No little third story here. Okay, and then the termination, of course, is in the very last cell, typically in cell. You do the same thing, and then you know you're done. Yeah. Ah, something uh, annoying, by the way, is um, I didn't, I didn't write. I'm not Durbin, right? That was not one of the authors of the book. I tell you, this would not have happened if I've been in that list. Because what Durbin does, the begin state, they say that state zero, and then they have the end state. What letter would you give it? L plus one. Do anything, but don't give it the number zero. That's what they do. Sorry, guys. The end state is called zero, and the begin state. Is yeah. Luckily, you will be able to tell what is the begin state, maybe at the beginning, what's the end state, maybe at the end. So you can discern it, but it's annoying anyway, right? That's uh, that, but that's Durbin, so we'll work with it. So here's just a simple example. Let's start doing it. Let's say the forward algorithm. Do you understand here? 
What does this mean? Stage 0 is the beginning stage. You see that? Which letter of the sequence should be in the beginning stage? Good question. No, no. Or should we name that letter? Should we call it 0? Let's say the letter starts with 1, 2, 3, so 0 means before the sequence. Okay? That's a nice one to start. So we say, so that means this is the starting probabilities that we need for the little March model. So this is just to say you have to start in the beginning stage. There will be all the probabilities, therefore you cannot be here and not be in the sequence. That should not be possible. So that probability is here. See that? Okay, now having established that, you can now ask the question, what would be the likelihood of the first letter in the sequence being in state one? And the input sequence, by the way, is TAGA. T A G H. Yeah? So, the first letter, which letter is that? The letter T in state 1. How could we get into state 1? It's the first letter. Look at the arrows. Which arrows lead into state 1? I can tell you. The arrow from the begin state, and it's the arrow from the state itself going back in. See that? There's no other arrow in this simple way. Meaning, these are non-zero probabilities, so there might be a number of errors that have zero, but we won't, we won't uh, depict them here, right? For simplicity's sake. So, now we just do the, the plusing, so what's the fourth algorithm? So let's do this one first. How do we get from here? If the first letter is here, which letter was there in the begin state? The letter zero, the zero symbol. What's the probability then of that state? We know it is one. So here you go. F, zero, the, the, from the begin state with the letter 0 times which transition probability to get to into the state from the begin state as this guy here and that is the transition probability 0, 1 A, 0, 1 here so can you fill them in please what's the likelihood of being in uh, before the sequence at symbol 0 in the begin state that was 1 here so this one is that one so what's this point 0.5 here this point 0.5 right Okay, so that's one. And now the other way. How could we get into this state in another way? From itself. Right? What does that mean? If we have the first letter in the state and we come from the one state earlier, what was in that state? The letter is the symbol zero. What's the likelihood? Ah, zero. So here we go. So this is the zero. What was this point two? Okay, tell me that. Transition to itself? Yeah, this point. Thank you. Very good. Okay, so we've done that one. Now we do another one. What's fun? This one is that the simple. Ah, here I see something. Let's do this one. Remember, break up. Let's check my phone after this evaluation. So, what's the likelihood of being in cell in state once, one, once again? But now having the second symbol of the sequence there. What is the second symbol of the sequence? Letter A, you agree? Okay, let's check. Again, how can we come into this cell? Are we known that by now from the begin state or from the, cell, from the state itself? So let's do them both. So, what would it mean if we have the second letter in this state and you come from the begin state? What should have been the first? What should have been, sorry, what should have been the letter in the begin state? Is that letter zero? No, that should be letter one. Is that defined? Can you have a begin state which is a silent state? No. So that probability is zero. All emission probabilities in the silent state are zero. So there's this zero here. And then what this this would, would this is the space for transition probability. So it's the emission probability times the transition probability. But if one of the two is zero, that will be zero, right? So that's the one coming from the beginning state. But now, what's the other possibility of ending in state one having the second letter of the sequence? That is being in the state before having the first letter of that sequence, was it earlier? What are the probabilities there? This is what I like to see here. What's this point 50? Guys, do you see that somewhere? Probably 14. You calculated that a moment ago. Oh, that course you have it. You don't need to do it. You have it. So this point 50, for what? The likelihood of the first letter into state one. That's what we need here. And then what is this probability? Once again, this is already remarked, the transition for real right? You faithfully take upper emission probabilities 
and the transition from green. So you have that, right? So this is how it works. And in the end, you do the same thing for this tank. You look where you can come from. So here you see that. How can you come into the begin state in this model? You can come from state 3 or from state 4. What do we need to do? And, and what letters should you have in that sequence? Here, you should have seen the, which letters should have been in the before last state, before the end state, the last letter of the sequence, because the end state is silent. You should have seen all letters, of course. So everybody is fourth letter then into state 3 times this transition probability. A35 or the probability that the last letter is in state 4 times or time this position. You know, the same thing. Yeah? We're not entirely happy to tell us, but I think we're happy with this. What's the time, right? Do you have a question? Yes, we do. Okay. So basically, what are you going to do? And here, so what, what is here? Uh, this is the palace. So what will happen? Yeah. Suppose you, you, you want to know what's the Viterbi value of this cell. What do you do? Where can you come from? From each of those cells, the last one, where all possible cells you can come from are. You are at a certain position i in the sequence here. That means if you're in that cell, that should be at sequence position the one before i minus 1. You, you just take all those probabilities you have. You, if you want to come from this one, this is the cell you were interested in. If you evaluate the possibility of coming from this cell, what do you do? You take the value, you multiply that value with this transition probability, and then times this emission probability. Right? You do this for all possibilities, and then for the term you check the max. You find one, if you have a number of them that score all the highest, you can take uh, the highest in the row, something, call it high row, call it anything. Uh, and then, and then what do you remember from that cell, that this will be the best state, ending up in this cell, the most high, the highest scoring, you would and you would put a pointer from this cell to there. You would remember that to get into this cell you came from there. Now, if you have somewhere in the end the highest value, that would be your end result. And what is the most likely path if you end up there? You just hold back all, all, all like little thumb. Boom, all these pointers you follow to the beginning. That's what you do. So, the same holds, of course, in a small model like you will have, that you check the same thing, and this is what you told the paper, right? If you want to calculate here, that means you have the letter T in the sequence. You check all the states here, where it will be the letter A, the first letter. So it will be the probability of this cell, you think, here. In the state, the first letter should be zero. And so you do that. If you do it faithfully, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Once again, it sounds boring, but it's been a bit All right, so we've done the forward algorithm instead of, well, then I go to there. We just did this example, and here is again trying to reassure you that these algorithms are basically the same or very similar. And what's the only difference? You answer two problems. To determine the algorithm is to find the most likely path, a single path that is then known that you should reconstruct through the model. And the forward algorithm, you don't bother with knowing the path, you want that score, the best score including all possible pathways, and the, with the probability sum. So the only difference between the algorithms is you change the, the max, or you change the delta in the forward, or uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the actual in the forward, addition sign to max. Okay. That's it. You can do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, and now we have another thing. You know, what are, what are we doing here? We're adding up lots of small probabilities, right? Suppose we are still worried that this end result would be, um, you know, too small for a computer. To, to, to sort of zero. Then you could say, oh, I, I tried a lock. But now we need to take, oh, that works. Now we have to, don't have a lock of multiplication. You have, what is the lock of A plus B plus C? Would that happen? The answer is no. Now we need more difficult mathematics. 
And you know, and we cross over it, but if you want to go to a section of three states where Durbin gives two fairly tedious solutions to this problem. But since we are not bothering at all with taking logs in this assignment, we give you this. Okay, so the last question, now not the easiest one, although we've done it already, in fact, uh, but this is what you need to do before you can start using a program. If you want to use a, a model, if you want to use a hidden market model in HMM, you need to have all parameters defined. And to get those parameters, how should you get them? Maybe you have a good brain and you catch the ball. Great. Start running immediately. No problem. But, you know, with a less of genius, you have to do something. And that is, you feed it a set of sequences. You want to do something. You want to predict the gene or uh, predict secondary structure, recognize a certain protein family. What do you do? Say that it's about recognizing globin, hemoglobin sequences. So what do you do? You look for a set of hemoglobin sequences, feed those through the model, set the parameters according to those sequences, and what do you hope to get if you use the model? If you feed an immunoglobulin sequence through that model, what would happen to the score, you would hope? Hopefully a bit low, and then you give it another global sequence, and then the model says, yay, high score. Now, one element of training. Suppose I train the model so well that it recognizes each sequence. Fed it hundred sequences. It recognizes these hundred somehow because we're training. Is that a good thing? That's a good note. I like that. Why is that not a good thing? Ah, overfitting, you already know the word. Look at it, very good. What does it mean? And what is the problem with overfitting? Then the model does not generalize one, right? So you won't be able to recognize other sequences but in the same family that you would not have seen before. And that's not good. You want to use the model to recognize, of course, stuff outside your training sequences, because you already know about these training sequences. That's why you use them. Because you know stuff. So, that is uh, all of this called the learning problem. Uh, so, how do we, so there are, there are really uh, quite a few algorithms that you can use to set the parameters, but we'll do the, the, the main, the most widely used one, the main one that is uh, nice in itself to know. I mean, again, like we always do, we will use the concept of maximum likelihood. Those features we want to recognize, the hemoglobin sequence, if that is what we want to recognize, we hope that the evaluation of hemoglobin sequence will lead to the highest possible score. We want to have high scores for a feature for the okay. That's the concept of XLM. Okay, um, what have you got? We have a model. Well, have you got a model? We have the boxes. We have said, okay, that's the work of art. Eh? We have made the states. We have the, the arrows and we have the boxes in each of the states, but we don't have the parameter. That's what uh, we have a model. And we have a set of training sequences, the training sequence. So we need to find the most likely parameters to explain the training sequence, meaning the feature in the training sequence should, should start scoring high. And then here's the point of overfitting or overtraining, if you like. We go to find a model that generalizes well. Yeah? So sequences we haven't seen before. If we train on global sequences, it would be nice when, this, when the, the, the model recognizes an unseen global sequence. That's generalization. Okay. Now, there are two possible ways. Suppose you have um, you have a model with parameters. So the idea is, I should say that, we start not with nothing. We start with a model, and we have to start, like it or not, fill in the parameters. You give it a value. It might make sense, it might not make sense, but we will give it a value. You give all the values 0.25 in the boxes, reach of the four letters of DNA, who cares? These values, yeah? and if you know how to guess, do that, I would say. But if not, you do something. Um, but uh, so, and now, now, for example, we've used that model and we've fed sequences and we've carried out a Viterbi algorithm for each of the training sequences. What do we have after the Viterbi algorithm? The score. Of what? The score of the test scoring path. 
Did you do the trace back? Let's say yes. So do we know the path? Yes. For each sequence in the training set, after the material in the example, we know the path, the best path to take to Exactly. Those are the next two. Yeah? So we could, how could we train our parameters or the, of the model? We've used it, but now we train them again. We, we want to learn from what we have calculated. So that means for each sequence, we know the state map, right? That's for example, after Spergo, it might be you know it in another way. Maybe your model makes it clear. But always, say after Viterbio, you know one thing for sure, we have the state map for each of the sequences. So that's great. So how can we then say, how do we want to to, uh, to optimize these parameters. Now, I'll give you an idea. Let's go to a picture. Come on. The nearest picture. Ah, here is one. Now I want it bigger. Here, this one. Okay. Think about it like this. This is, um, this is these are boxes that made of wood. There are little, you know, there are little boxes in here. So I should, uh, these are, and these are, these are pipes really. So. We put it upside down, the begin state is now up. You know what we do? We throw water in the begin state. A little bit. Right? And then it will trickle through the model. Here. If we have high scoring parameters, what would it be? If this is point 0.9 and this is point 0.1, shall, shall we say that makes the tube is wider? So 90% of the water will go through this one. 10% of the water will go through there. So that means more water ends up in this box than it ends up in that box. Will eventually all go out to the next state. What is ends up in there? And now the question is, how wide are these little boxes? If the letter uh, A is more likely, more water will go through. So the water is divided over these four letters, if you want. And then it goes on. So this is how the model. You throw water. Now if that happens, so if you would view that, oh, a hell of a lot of water relatively go through this letter G in this state. What would you like the likelihood and parameter you want to set for to be? My suggestion is that you observe that that should be high. So if your training sequence is say, if you all feed this through that model, and somehow, you know, this letter in this box gets, you know, many of the pathways have a high probability there, then hey, maybe it's a good idea to do that. That's what we are going to do in an algorithm, okay? That's the basic field. At least when I think about it, I think it's useful to you know, leave that to you to decide. Useful to you. Uh, so the basic question is how can we learn a set of parameters? This is done. Okay, so if you know the state path, then it's very easy. You have all these training sequences, you know exactly, ah, the best part of this training sequence is in that letter in that box, and then in that through this position probability, and then it goes in that box, and so on. You know all of it. So that's maybe easy. And you can do this, you can just count over the 100 training sequences. How often did it go in the letter A in state 5? And how many times did the letter T in state 5 was visited and so on? So what do we do? For all the emission problems, just count how many, was the, how many times was the letter B evaluated, emitted, and then you divide it by all of the letters. Now you have the fraction letter B in that box, right? The percentage letter B in that box. Okay, that's what you do. And here, you do basically the same thing. You say, okay, from all states, so how often, how much water went to this transition parameter, coming out of the state, and the idea here is, this is the one we're all about. That was our AKL here. You can read it. Maybe write a bit bigger. Okay. Hold here. It's not quite people. That's good. Uh, and then, you know, make the other arrow to other boxes. This might be a million, we don't know. So what's the fraction again? There you see it happening. What do you say? Coming out, so this probability, you add up all those probabilities. So the total chance of getting out of the box, you say, what's the fraction of the one that is coming out of the box? This is how to think. Okay. Good. So, this is when things are easy, and you know the path. What's our problem? We have training sequences, uh, we feed them through a model with some fake parameters we said at the start. We don't have the concept of the best path. We would like total probability, so what can we do? 
That's the idea here. Now, ah, you know, I'll gloss over this bit. And here you can also zip, you know, zero problems that it might not occur. But zero age in the box. What happens with these type of things? If something is zero, you have a mathematical problem. So what do you do? Super counting, right? Also that plays a role here. We won't do this in the year. But there is also super counting you can resort to here. Anyway. What are we going to do? We're going to set fake parameters at the start. We call those priors. It sounds a bit more scientific, right? Prior probabilities. <laughs> Maybe you know something, you said them, or you just guess wildly. Who cares? Uh, we should care, by the way, but you know, we could do that. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, you know, that's the initialization of the parameters. And then we start using those parameters, to evaluate all our training sequences, update the parameters. We learn from the sequence update parameters, all them, all transition and emission parameters. And then we say we had a prior that was guessed. We have a first posterior. And you know what? We call our posterior now a prior. And you do it again. And what do you hope to get? That all these the parameters are reset every time again, every iteration, that the recognition of the feature you want to recognize in the model will be better all the time. Yeah. When do you stop? When you're happy or tired, or you find that your training doesn't optimize anymore. Yeah. That's the idea. That's what we're going to do. And basically, that is that uh, you calculate all the time, this is this water ID, the expected number of times for each transition or emission, and then you say when you have that, you maximize, and that is just taking this fraction. This thing, that is all about maximizing the likelihood. Basically, you take the frequency, and you say that will optimize the score of something I want to see. If there is a high, if, if a site is, if, if a cell is visited a lot, I would like to have higher probability for that one, reflecting it. Maximum. All right, so that's a that topic. So what do we need to have? This is a model. We need to find this trick we should carry out to find all transition and all emission problems. Now, here is this water ID. If you would be interested in the G in this box, for example, which left with the sequence is that, this one. If you are interested in having the G in the box, how can I get to this G? What should have happened before? <coughs> Ending in this box with the letter G. I can tell you. The letter C and A should have been emitted by the model. <coughs> you see the letters. And where should they then be? Where could they be in this model? Who knows? C, A is pretty simple, right? They should both be here, right? And, and, and what should happen afterwards? So how do I know? The letter G is, so this is how can I get into the box with the letter G, with the third letter here? And how can I get out of this box to the end state? What letter should I still emit? T. And how can you get being here via the letter V, via emitting the letter T to the end state? To the state itself in this box. This that is what we want to do. That is what we want to have, and that gives us a probability of that. Now, our likelihood is emitting G from state 4. If you see the C A G T is produced, meaning we talk about this G here. Okay. Uh, so this is basically what you what, what, well, what I told you. How can you get in this G? So that means the letter AC should have happened here. Four. Now we've done this bit, and now we have to do that one, and then hopefully it comes here, and this is the remaining bit. But then just don't. How do we get into the G in this box, and how can I get out of the G in this box? Walking on until you reach the end state. Reach the end state. Okay. Well, it is the total thing then. What are we going to do? What do we need for this? Can we calculate the probability of the letter G in this box coming from the beginning to as an ID? Do we have material for this or not at all? I thought you took over it, right? Let's do it. There we have four. What is it? The total probability of all subsequences C A G ending up here is the four algorithm. That letter in that box, okay? And how do we do this? Getting out to the end. Mm. 
And that, of course, that's it, right? That's what we're going to show you. I don't know if that's called a surprise. Do we have forward algorithm? And now this is called the backward algorithm. And you know what? This is almost a forward algorithm reverse. I'll give you the flavor of how to think about this. Is this one. So basically, using the forward algorithm, we can know how likely it is we get into this letter G. But now, we also need the likelihood of getting out of this letter G till the end. So what would you need to do for this path? You would need to go into G, take this transition probability, take this emission probability, take this transition probability, and they are done. How do you do this? That is, you calculate, your, but, but, you know, this is a simple model, right? You see here there is only one possibility of getting out of this box to the end state. Is that always the case? If you have a very big model, maybe you could go to many states and then to the end state. Right? Situation, if this was a non-silent state, you're here, you would like, how can you go to the end? It's like here or like that. So there can be many pathways out of the box to the end state. You have to take all of those into account as if you do the forward algorithm. So basically, um, this will be, uh, this, can I do it from here? Yeah, why not? Very big state, it's just the glorious end state here, okay? So we're interested in this letter, let's say the G again in this box. In how many, so what is now the total probability getting out of this letter G with the remaining bit of sequence, so it's a T here, which okay, could be more. Now what was it? You could walk like this, you could walk like this, or you could walk like that. And that is just what do you do in the forward how do you do this? And now we have to add up all those, the sum of all those probabilities to find the remaining likelihood of this bit of sequence from G till the end of the sequence. Not so much here, it's only the key following the real to be true. Okay? How are we going to do this? We already showed you this. What difference do you see if you compare it with the forward algorithm? I can imagine you don't have it really photographed in your head, but anyway, remember for some quantification of transition parameters and emission parameters. But what do we do different now? We do it from the end state back into the state we're interested in. It's the remaining bit of path. So we start in the end state. So we set I to L. And here we have this is this uh, annoying zero again for the end state, right? Okay, zero is to the, to the end state. And you uh, set these parameters. So here you go. You walk from the you start in the end state. And you all the time take a step to the preceding state that would have gone to the end state. And then you calculate all, uh, all probabilities uh, pertaining to that. And then you go on. So what do you see? You walk back. You start in the end state of sequence letter L. You go to the state preceding where the sequence letter L minus 1 would be in. You say, okay, that this would have been the transition probability from this L minus 1 letter in the state to the end state as well, and, and this is the backward score of the cell you have. It's really the forward algorithm in reverse. Okay? You can see that. And here you have, you know, what have you got here? What is the end if you go backward from the end state to the beginning state? Where will be the total probability? In what state? In the forward algorithm, we find the total probability in the end stage, where we find the total probability now in the beginning stage. Now, if you code it into algorithms, what is a nice way to test whether anything makes sense? You compare these two values. If they're the same, probably doing something correctly. Well, I should phrase it otherwise. If it's not the same, you certainly do something incorrect. Right? It's not necessarily the opposite side of things, but anyway. Okay, so this is really what it is. Now, there's one piece of bookkeeping I need to tell you. That's what you can see here. In the forward algorithm, you go from a number of states. Uh, these are states. I'll do more than three. So now you really see the thing. Uh, 
put the blackboard, uh, the board up so everybody can see it. Okay. What's in here? All everything that happened added up, including the transition probability of this state. The letter I, xi is now in here, so xi minus 1 was in here, before last symbol in the sequence. So everything is taken care of. All probabilities, it's done in this side. Everything, there is, all transition and emission probabilities are being taken into account. What do we do in the, with the, the backward algorithm? So there are many, many states that go now to the end somewhere. You walk back, you do all of this the exact same way. But you do not include this with that cell. Okay? Just one of you don't do this. In the forward algorithm you do it, in the backward algorithm you don't do not do it. It's nothing difficult, it's just one thing different. And why is that? There should be a reason. There's always a reason. Yeah, this is here I state fact it does not include the mission copy of the letter you're at in the sequence, in the state you're interested in. And, uh, you know, this is easier. Why? Here's the trick. Basically, the trick. you remember that letter G in that box? You would like to fill the value for that letter G. And we do it by the forward algorithm into that letter, and the backward letter into that letter from the end state. You just multiply the two answers. Let's say you will have your life in with your, your probability of that letter in the state. So that is really, really very helpful. Yeah? And here, so this is the probability. And now you can see here what you do here. You take it now as a fraction. This is the likelihood, say, of a letter in the state you're interested in. And the fraction of that letter, how do you get it if you divide it by the total probability of the sequence? What could, how could you calculate this one? The total probability of sequence to the forward algorithm, take the answer from the end state, or to the backward algorithm, take the answer from the begin state. Okay. Yeah. So you don't need to do, you know, what is enough, but it would be nice to test, of course, if it's the same in your hands. Yeah? Okay. So this is this water ID. What fraction of all the water gets through this little box, right? Given the training step. Now, one more step, because this was from one sequence, sorry, we have 100 sequences in our set, so what do we need to do? We need to do this for each of the sequences, add up the probabilities, that's what we do here, and then divide by the sum of all total probabilities. You see here that you run it over all training sequences J. You see that here? So, you see this is F times B divided by P, that's this. And you do this for all the hundred sequences. That's adding it. That's the jump. This is if you have a training set consisting of more than one sequence. You need to do this. Okay? This is for your emission probabilities. How often do I run through this box, this letter in this box, given my training sequence? That is. And this is the old one. Looks a bit more complicated. This is. Uh, yeah. State, another state, here is the letter I minus 1 in, here would be the letter I in, for example. And we now are interested, how should I set the value for the transition probability? We need to score this with the exact same principle, right? Now, what do you see? How can I get, what is, how can I pinpoint this probability? What should I have done? Well, this is the preceding state. I need to know the total probability getting into that state from the beginning, of all possible pathways, forward algorithm. And I need to know from the end, how can I get in this state? That's what you see here. Look, right. one letter was here, I, in the sequence. What letter is then here? Here is the letter I of the sequence, I plus one. So here we have I, according to this formula. Here then we have I plus anymore. I plus one, okay. Look. We need forward score into state K. This is 
space L, forward score. This is the backward score, is the letter I plus 1 in state L, this is the backward score. What have you got if we are here? All transition probabilities, probabilities including the emission probability of this cell. What have you got if you are here with the backward algorithm? All transition probabilities, all emission probabilities, but not the emission probability in that cell. What do you see here? This is the one we're talking about, right? This guy we're interested in. Do you see the forward score, the backward score of what? Symbol further up, or was this here? No, and we know it. That's the one we didn't have so far, but Durbin decided to do it like that. So we have the emission probability of what? Of the letter. So now we have everything. So, and again, this is the score for this one. If you would have a single sequence, and we need to do this for our 100 trading sequence, so we'll run over each of those sequences. Take that probability, divide it by P again, same thing. And this is the formula that was just there a moment ago. Same. Okay? So, what do we do? We have for each of the given the training set, we now have a probability for each emission probability in each of the boxes and each of the transition probabilities. Is that enough? What are we going to do? That's the expectation step. Now we get the maximization step. We have these values now for each of those things in the box, and we just normalize it like we did, like I showed you before, for the emission probabilities and the transition probabilities. And now you're done. This is one step in the, 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 the iterative training protocol. You had a prior, you run the forward and the backward algorithm, the sequences are all evaluated. And you, from this trick, you find your value, your a posteriori parameter, using the training set. And you, this is then the, the value after doing the probabilities like this. These are your values. So you have now your complete model trained one time. And what could you now do? You say, that's very nice. We fill in these values in the model. And I do it once again. That's iterative training. Yeah. And that iteration is really a bound algorithm. This, this type of algorithms are called expectation maximization algorithms. You have an expectation step, that's a good step, and, and this one for the emission and transition probabilities, and this is the maximum. Just works. Okay, so what's nice about this? If you train this and you do this in your practical, you score all of these sequences. Then you will find that pretty soon it will, it, will, it, will, it will converge, it will not change anymore. So the training is done. Yeah? You can find it. What is one of the problems? It's like climbing um, in a mountainous landscape. You're in Switzerland, right? Switzerland. You, uh, you start, uh, somebody says you're here. Okay? And somebody says, you climb, climb to the hilltop, you know. It's, this is about getting to the highest top, the highest point in the whole of Switzerland. Oh, you like the idea. Maybe they're walking. So, what do you do? You walk up this mountain. And then you're on top. And you're sure, you know, the top will be inside and you'll be so happy to look over the whole of Switzerland. Switzerland, maybe. And the um, and, um, so, and then you do it and you're here. Are you happy now? You can be proud that you climbed the hilltop, the mountain top. But then, only then you find out, you know, the mountain. What can you do? The algorithm won't solve it to you. That's the thing it does. It goes, and so it's only taking steps up. You would have now, you would need an algorithm that says, now walk down a bit and then try it over, you know. Maybe then you have a chance to climb the second mountain. What do you have to do this? So what do you do? Only the best. Start at the right mountain, of course. Yeah, 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 that's, that's all they would keep 
So what could you do? Remember to set priors. And then you optimize it. The prior is sort of you're down at the mountain. Then you do your training. You climb up the mountain if that's better. But then you might end up in a local maximum. The wrong hilltop. If you start, if you say, you know what, since I think about, you know, good idea will be, I'll, I'll, I'll do not walk once, I uh, walk uh, 50 times, and I start at all different points in Switzerland. Then you have a chance that maybe all you will have that you start somewhere here, and you will run up, you know, climb up the right top. So the idea is, translate it back to algorithmics, start with multiple priors, and the more different the priors are, you might say, the more chance you have to cover the landscape, you have a higher chance to not fall in this local optimization. It's all. Okay? That's the idea. So it's here to avoid the problem. Train multiple times in different initial. Computers can do this. So that's the idea. Um, okay, so. Um, that was the solo problem. If you do this, you train iteratively, how would you stop? What do you know? What is training? You feed it your 100 sequences, you set the parameters, but what do you know? You also know, of course, the score given them all for each of the sequences. Would that help you? What do you hope that happens with the score of each of the sequences? If you train the next model, you want to find global sequences, you feed it global. What would you hope that happens with that total score? Which actually, I should tell you, is called the log likelihood. This is just the log of the, of the, the, sum, the, the sum of the log of each of the sequence scores. This goes up if the scores of the sequence are high. What do you hope to get happen with the score in each training iteration? I can tell you. If it trains well, you hope that at that point you want to see scores better all the time. So the recognition of the training set. You should hope to see a curve that does something like this. That total sum, the most likely score over all the sequences. And after a while you will see if you, you know, I shouldn't predict it, this is what you will find out on the side of it. You should not provide all the answers on the side of it. Anyway, maybe this happens. And when are you tired, would you stop? Say when I should when you really stop training. Would this happen? So probably you do something wrong with that, okay? So keep an eye on that. I will stop somewhere here. Or here if it's all expensive. Okay. That's that. Okay, so yeah, that's the uh, again the water model I think, you know. So you have a model, you feed it the training sequence. Some of the states are more popular than others given that set of sequences. So some of the transitions are more popular than others. We would like to upweigh those and it would try to. Okay. Um, and you do this, the trick is using the forward and back term. So you will need to program both algorithms and carry out a little bit differently. This is all part of the assignment. So if you've done your assignment, you'll be able to answer the three questions. The decoding problem, what's the best path? The, uh, the total probability problem, but you know what's the probability of my sequence and the training problem. Let's do this stuff here. Okay. Um, Viterbi training. Oh, I, I, in fact, I, I already told you this. What is Viterbi training? What is Viterbi training? To carry out the Viterbi algorithm instead of the um, law of the forward and the backward algorithm. You get your path. Pick the scores along your path, and in the end, with your training sequence, you have all these scores, and you just can count and convert that to a to a mm -hmm. Is that good? And here it says, uh, does it say something about it? Is there? Uh, yeah. Okay. This converges. That is near the end. Yeah, okay. um, this will converge even more rapidly than the Paul Wells algorithm, and. Um, you know, when would it stop? And of course, your path will not change anymore. They're really done. And what can you say about it? The diehards say, well, the therapy training, you know, it's, it's, it's not so good as Pablo But the answer will be, 
It depends what you want to do. Suppose you would like to learn the path from your training from, from, from a model that you're all about this. I would like to find out the alignment pathway of a global of global sequences. So then you would then it's about finding that path and then we take the training is really what you should do, right? So it depends on on what you want to do. But in general, Vitaly training trains a bit less well than the problem itself would work. Try to work to explain to you uh, in the last 10 minutes. Okay. Now, can you train in another way? What about the genetic algorithm? You all know the genetic algorithm, you've all seen that. You know Darwin, genes, going into the next generation, survival of the fittest. That is a GA, a genetic algorithm. But there is another one. This is all many algorithms. I think I might have told you that before. Many of computer science algorithms are directly inspired by that. Observing life systems, learn from it and do something. So the GA is one example. And of course, particle swarm, swarm optimization is another one. You can take it from insects or from, from, from birds. You know, no winter time, you see it. Patterns you get from birds going to Africa. They learn from this. They optimize. Um, and then all along with fishes, uh, schools of fishes. One of my favorite algorithms is the uh, ant colony optimization. Have you heard of that one? That's a nice one. What do ants do? Very quickly, right? Uh, I could check how many slides they have. What's the time? Just ten more. Ah, you know what? I do that in the next slide. Here we go. Because I promised you something else. Um, then I will show you a few slides on alignment. Do you remember how alignment works? Was that again the score? Why the dog is anyway? Who had match and mismatch parameters and gap penalties? Do you remember that? Putting minus signs in and all that stuff. You can see models that do that here. Yeah, so you have a match state and you have an insert state for the one sequence and an insert state for the other sequence. And this is for local alignment. So and you see, this is all alignment in the market models for alignment. There will be a year where we go over in the assignment to this. It will not come back so far because this is quite a bit more complicated. And then you see more of those models. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, yeah, okay, it's cash people, you see? In the market models. <laughs> Get the phone now, right? Okay, anyway. Uh, look at the. Um, so, this is a hidden market model for multiple alignment, okay? Just cross over a bit, but you get the idea, hopefully. So, you have match states. This is when the letters will end up uh, on one another, aligned. And here you have an insert state, so you put the gap in the one block. And, the, and you have a deletion state if you put the gap in the other block. And uh, let's see. Here's a multiple alignment. We want to build a hidden market model. What could we do? We should make match states, insert states, and delete states. Now we are a scientist. Which, what will your match states be if you look at this? Do you agree that should be the gray areas? That's what Anders Krop told us in his book. Why is that? Well, there's more variability here, and there are gaps here, so maybe. But is that a necessity? You take the gray bits like is telling you, no, what's the science? So if you open a web, yeah, yeah, it works, right? So you could say, try a couple of balls, and then do it, yeah? So I think with that, and then this is the result, you can read this, uh, this chapter, put it online, and uh, there are lots of searches now. So hidden markup is used a lot in the, in, in the CD business, okay? And with that, I think, ah, this is your assignment. You know it already? The task at hand is to build a hidden market model, a cracking good hidden market model that should be able to dissect the sequence in domain areas and linker areas in between domains. And here's a feature of the domain and the linker area and the next domain and the linker area and the linker area back. That is your task, okay? And I wish you all good luck with that.